All right, we're in Colossians chapter one. We're gonna start in verse one, but we're gonna focus in on, on verses three through five. In verse one, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in, in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. And in verse three, he says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope laid out for you in heaven. Of this you've heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. And so Paul begins his um, epistle to the Colossians um, in just telling them of his thankfulness and the prayer that he is uh, praying for them. And um, see, Paul was a man of prayer, right? Paul was always praying. Paul prayed in the good times and the bad times. He prayed for individual believers. He prayed for uh, churches. He prayed for um, the whole body of Christ. He prayed for cities. He prayed for regions. He prayed uh, for strength and boldness for him, that he might be bold as he preached and proclaims the gospel to like kings and governors. Um, prays for uh, strength and boldness in the face of execution. Um, he prays all the time for everything. Um, and he's thankful to God. He prays in thankfulness. He prays when he is sad. Um, and then Paul tells believers to do the same things. In, in, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul actually tells the believers there, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, um, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Okay, so it's not just, Paul's not just praying for him. He's saying, look, this is something we should all be doing, right? And it is, it is something we should all be doing. Um, prayer is our communion, our intimacy with our Father. And we can learn all about him um, in his word, and that's great, right? We know about him um, through the word. Um, but that's really, can, it can be an exercise in um, just intellectual knowledge, right? Um, but we get to know him in an intimate way in our times of prayer and of worship. Um, and this is something God desires, and it should be something that we desire as well as people who say we love him, um, who have been adopted by our Father. And so he says, we always thank God, the Father. Okay, and so Paul prays, when he prays, he prays to his Father who is in heaven, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he doesn't pray to saints. He doesn't pray to um, his ancestors. He doesn't pray even to Jesus. He definitely doesn't pray to Mary because I think she's still alive at this time. Um, but Paul prays to the Father. And this is what Jesus taught his disciples to do, right? They, they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And, and Jesus told them, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who's in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just as, just as it is in heaven. And so Jesus even taught his disciples to pray to his Father. And, and if Jesus did it, if the disciples did it, if Paul did it, then that's how we should pray as well, right? So we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This word Lord is kurios. It means master or Lord. And here Paul is acknowledging um, the lordship of Jesus Christ. In some of his other epistles, he even introduces himself as Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's just saying, look, I am a servant of my Lord and master, Jesus Christ. He has bought me with his blood and I am not my own. The life I now live, I live by faith in the son of God, right? And so he is our master. He is our Lord and we are his servants and that requires our obedience in all things. We don't get to pick and choose what we obey and what we don't. I'm speaking to myself here, right? We can't just pick and choose. He is the Lord and we are the servant. The other cool thing about this word kurios is it also is translated in the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which would have been available to, available to Paul in his day. Um, it's This word kurios is translated Yahweh. And so even here, we see clues and indicators to the deity of Jesus Christ. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Um, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, so he hears of their faith from Epaphras. He hears from their faith in Christ Jesus, and he begins to pray. And his prayer is a prayer of thankfulness, right? Why is Paul thankful for their faith in Christ Jesus? He's thankful for their faith in Christ Jesus because our faith in Christ is the basis of our salvation. It's the basis of our inclusion in the body of Christ. And nothing needs to be added to our faith. Our faith is sufficient. Our faith in Christ Jesus is the, the, the basis of our salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, For by grace you've been saved through faith. Okay? Not of works, not any other thing. In other words, our faith's not based in any other thing. We don't have faith in our good works. We don't have faith in, the, the, in, in our following of the law of Moses. We don't have faith in our circumcision. We don't have faith in, in the dietary laws and restrictions. We don't have faith in how many grandmas we help cross the street in our life. And if we get to heaven, God's going to weigh our good works and our bad works. And based on that, he's going to enter us into heaven. No, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And all our righteous works are like filthy rags. And so we don't need to base our faith in new breakthroughs of visions, of, of prophecies, of hearing and speaking with angels, or of reaching some higher dimensions of enlightenment through our meditations. Okay, we are saved by grace through faith. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. 
what's not of yourselves? Faith. Our faith is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so Paul hears about their faith in Christ Jesus, and he is thankful, and he begins to rejoice, and he thanks God the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, since he heard of their faith in Christ Jesus. And he says, and of the love that you have for all the saints. Why is Paul thankful for their love? Well, because love is the evidence of our genuine faith in Christ Jesus, okay? Love is a byproduct. It's, it's, a, it's produced through a genuine relationship with God and through sanctification by the Spirit of God who was given to us when we believed, right? Um, um, by um, in, uh, Jesus, told his disciples in John 13, he said, he said this, look, by this they will know. Like in other words, everyone's gonna know, by this you will, they will know that you're my disciples. Everyone's gonna know you're my disciples based upon this one thing that you have love one for another, okay? So faith is the evidence um, that we are his. Um, the Apostle John said something similar in his first epistle. He said, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Then he says, anyone who does not love God does not know God because God is love. And so love is a barometer, right? It's how we can test the genuineness or the condition of our faith in Jesus. Um, in in uh, Galatians chapter five, Paul says, well, in, in chapter five, basically he lists like this big list of what we could call like the fruit of a life of iniquity or the fruit of unrighteousness, the, the fruit of the unredeemed, okay? And it's this big list of all this, you know, sin and debauchery and stuff like that. And then in verse 22, he says, but the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And so uh, basically what he's saying is like, look, if, you, if we find ourselves um, lacking in these areas and these fruits of the spirit, um, it may be a sign that we've wandered or maybe we're drifting um, in our relationship with God. And it, and it also could be a sign like if we're not exhibiting these fruits, but we are exhibiting the others, that maybe we're not in Christ at all. And so we need to check ourselves and check our faith and make sure that we are in Christ, okay? Um, Peter says something very similar to that in Second Peter. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge and knowledge, self-control. And self-control, like supplement that with steadfastness and steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brother, brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. He says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you can have knowledge of Jesus Christ and have no fruit, and it just stays what but that is. It stays knowledge, and it never actually produces life. It never produces eternal life and salvation and sanctification, because if you have sanctification, if you have the Spirit of God living inside of you, if you have salvation, if you've been adopted into the family of God, and if you belong to Christ, then you're going to exhibit these other characteristics, and the ultimate one is love love, right? Because God is love. He says, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, he says, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Okay. And so this is another, another place where he's saying, look, check your calling, check your election, check your salvation, check your faith, find out if it is real, the real thing, or if it's um, not the real thing. Okay. And so, Last last point I'm hammering home on this um, is in 1 Corinthians when Paul says, if I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, I'm a noising gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I don't have love, I have nothing. If I give away all that I have and I deliver my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Okay, and so all these works and all these th things that you can do with your life, it's nothing and it means nothing if you have not love because love is the actual evidence of what is truly important, faith in Jesus Christ because that's the only thing that can bring us to salvation and reconcile us with his Father. Um, so he says, now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest is love. And so he says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, your love for all the saints. And now he says, because of. Okay? because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. And so this, according to this passage, Paul's, what Paul's saying is he's saying basically our faith and our love are a product or a byproduct or are produced by something else. Okay, And what that thing is, is our hope. Okay, um, And he says, because of your hope laid up for you in heaven. So what is this hope that's laid up for us in heaven? 
Um, it's our salvation, right? Our, our salvation is the cleansing and forgiveness of our sins. It is um, being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, okay? And so this process of salvation is that we hear the gospel, right? We hear the gospel because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How can someone believe in whom they have never heard? And how can they hear unless someone preaches? And how can someone preach unless they are sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace? And so we know that God's word never returns void. It always accomplishes the purpose for which he sent it. And so in his word, Word. His word is a seed, right? That's like the parable of the sower. Um, someone preaches the gospel and the gospel comes into our ears and goes into our heart, right? And so we, we hear the gospel and we hear the promises that are promised and we begin to hope in them. And this is a hope that is produced by the Spirit of God, right? It's the beginning of regeneration as it causes us to desire things that, that we've never desired for. Why? Because we've been dead in our trespasses and sins, but he is about to make us alive in Christ. And so we begin to hope in those promises of God that I could be cleansed of my sin, really me? I could be forgiven despite everything I, I've done? Like that's so hard to imagine, but oh, how much I would love to be cleansed of my sin and made whole and made clean, right? And so as we, we begin to hope in, in his promises, um, then we look to the one who promised and we realized He's faithful because he's not a man that he should lie. And from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. And as we begin to reach out and put our trust in the one who promised, that is our faith. That's faith, right? That also is from God. And as we believe in the one who promised, God seals us with the Holy Spirit of promise. In, in um, Ephesians chapter 1, I believe it's verse 13, he says, And you also, when you, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, right? And so God um, causes us to hope through his word. He causes us to believe through faith, to take hold of his salvation through that faith. And he seals us with his Holy Spirit. He begins to sanctify us. And that, that process of sanctification, that is making us, transforming us into the image of Christ. We're being made into his image. He says, behold, I take out your heart of stone and I put in its place a heart of flesh. I put my spirit within you and I cause you to walk in my statutes and to obey my commandments. That is what salvation looks like. As we begin to walk in those commandments and those statutes, as we begin to obey them, as we begin to be transformed by the spirit of God, look, we begin to feel and sense that like the promises of God become tangible to us, right? We can taste the promises, we can see them, we can see that they're right there, right? And we begin, they, we begin to see them manifested in and through our lives and the lives of the brothers and sisters that are around us. In fact, we begin to catch glimpses of our Savior in our brothers and sisters, and they begin to catch glimpses of him in us as we are sanctified into his image. And all of this causes us to hope even more, right? Because now his promises are real. They're right in front of us. They're being lived out in our lives and in the lives of those around us. His kingdom has come. We are citizens of a new kingdom, right? We've been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, and we begin to hope more. And faith rises more, right? And our love abounds. And this is what he's talking about. Look, I... Always, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith, your saving faith in Christ Jesus, and of your love for all the saints, the evidence of your salvation. Um, and all that is because of the hope that's laid up for you, reserved for you, set aside for you, waiting for you uh, until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. So that's the first five verses of Colossians.